Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Boudreau. I'm Manamit's Donor Relations Manager. I want to thank you so much for joining us for this afternoon's presentation, Soft Shell Green Crabs 101. We've got a great program for you, and we're excited to tell you more about the work we're doing, which is the result of a multi-year collaboration between Manamit and New Hampshire Sea Grant. If you're new to Manamit, we are a science-driven sustainability nonprofit. Since our beginnings in 1969, our programs have branched out far beyond our Plymouth, Massachusetts-based banding operations with shorebird recovery and habitat management, forestry and climate science, fisheries, and more. Manamit has its foundation in science and works with many global partners to create a thriving future for us and for birds. Just a couple of quick things before we begin. At the bottom of your Zoom screen, you should see a box marked Q&A. If you don't see it, just use your mouse pointer to hover over it and it should appear. Uh, if at any point during today's presentation you have a question, just click on that Q&A box and enter it so that Marissa and Gabby can answer it at the end. Uh, and if you're unable to stay for the entirety of today's presentation, we are recording it and we'll share with you in a follow-up email a link where you can watch or share it with others. So again, thank you so much for joining us. And now I'd like to turn it over to Marissa McMahon and Gabby Bratt. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, okay, can you hear me? You're good. Okay. Um, well, thank you for that intro, Chris. Um, uh, I, I'm Marissa McMahon, and um, I'm a, the director of the fishery science program here at Manama. Um, I'm going to start the presentation off, but first I just was going to have Gabby um, step in for a minute and, and give herself a chance to introduce. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us. I'm Gabby Brat, and I am the fisheries extension specialist for New Hampshire Sea Grant and UNH Cooperative Extension. All right. Awesome. So yeah, thank you guys for, for joining today. Um, so Gabby and I have been working together for several years now on developing soft shell green crab fisheries and markets. Um, this work in particular that we're going to be talking about today is actually funded by NOAA. We um, have been working on this project um, for about two years now, but even before we received NOAA funding for this work, we actually had, had been working together on developing soft shell fisheries. Um, so originally our plan was to actually host a, a sort of hands-on in-person workshop or training um, uh, in terms of the soft shell fishery. Um, but of course that was sort of our plan pre-pandemic and so we've pivoted now to this virtual platform and um, providing some virtual content and the, the real idea here is that, you know, we're going to sort of give a, a broad overview, but we really want this webinar to be useful for people who actually want to participate as soft shell green crab fishers. Um, and so we're hopeful that the, the content we've put together can really be sort of a tool for folks to um, be able to participate in this fishery. So I'm going to start really um, at sort of the most simple and broad level and just introduce the species in general, um, which is the European green crab, um, scientific name Carcinus manus. Um, so this is an invasive species. They invaded the east coast of North America in 1817. Um, they came here from Europe in ship ballast water. Um, and so for, for folks who may not be familiar with green crabs, I thought it would be good to just sort of give a little bit of an overview of what they look like and how to ID them. And really the distinctive attribute that you look for with a green crab to, to tell them apart from other crab species are these five spines or teeth that you see on either side of the eyes. So that's sort of the first indication that you have a green crab in your hand um, and, and not some other species. They are called a green crab. Um, you know, that's partially because of this sort of mottled coloring that you see on the backside or dorsal side of the crab, sort of this greenish brownish mottled color coloring. However, it can be um, sort of confusing um, because once you flip the crab over, they can be a whole range of different colors. Um, so this is a, this picture here is a little bit blurry, but um, you know, essentially it's just showing the 
wide color range that you find in green crabs. Um, so despite the fact that their name is the green crab, oftentimes they have this more orange or red coloration. And the color is, um, you know, something that we're still learning a lot about in terms of what that means. Um, there's some evidence it's linked to the growth cycle, some evidence that it's linked to different sort of physiological tolerances of the animal um, in terms of environmental factors. Um, but I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time on that. I just really wanted this slide to um, sort of introduce folks to what they look like and, and how to identify them. So the next sort of big broad um, intro uh, slide is really, you know, pertaining to why we're doing this. Why are we creating fisheries and markets for green crabs? Well, as I mentioned, they're an invasive species. Um, they are, you know, a very harmful invasive species here in um, New England and, and elsewhere. They've actually, um, they're a global invader. They've invaded every continent except Antarctica. So here in New England, they're a very voracious predator of bivalve species like softshell clams, which is pictured here, a green crab eating a softshell clam. Um, the, the thin, brittle shell of the clam means that it really has no um, protection against predation from the crab. And so what we've actually seen is that green crabs have decimated softshell clam populations in New England. They um, also... Um, Um, they also um, eat other bivalves like mussels and oysters and scallops, and um, they destroy critical coastal habitats like salt grass and um, or salt marsh rather and eelgrass. So lots of negative um, impacts of this invader. And you know, for decades, people have really sort of scratched their heads about how we mitigate this, you know, these harmful impacts. But I think right now, at this moment in time, it's becoming an even more pressing issue because what we're seeing is that green crabs are increasing with increasing water temperatures. So um, this is just a figure to, to show sort of those increases in water temperatures that we've seen um, in, in more recent decades. So this is sort of the long-term trend with that black dashed line. And then if you look in just the most recent past, the green line is showing an accelerated warming trend. And in just the past decade, the red line is showing a very, very accelerated warming trend. So the Gulf of Maine is actually warming faster than 99% of the rest of the world's oceans. And that warming is of course projected to continue to occur. So as this warming is happening, we're seeing green crab abundance is really exploding. And, and so as you know, projected continued warming occurs, we expect that these invaders are going to continue to thrive and become more abundant. And so um, that sort of led Gabby and I to this, if you can't beat them, eat them strategy. And that's, you know, another way of saying that is if they're here and they're here to stay, is there some way that we could benefit from them through creating fisheries and markets? And so um, in, in sort of looking around the world at other places that might be a good model for this, um, we can look to this Italian fishery for a very similar species of green crab. And this is a soft shell fishery that has operated in Venice, Italy for hundreds of years. And the, the species that they're fishing for is almost identical to the green crabs that we have here. Um, this photo is actually taken by one of our project partners, Jonathan Taggart, who has connections in Venice and has been really great with facilitating um, transfer of knowledge and, and um, information about their fishery. And one of the things that made this fishery really appealing to us was that the crab fishers in Venice actually get as much as $55 a pound for the soft shell product. And in the past two to three years, Gabby and I have been piloting this, this work here in the US in terms of creating our own soft shell fishery. And what we found is that we can get about 25 to $30 a pound for these soft shell green crabs. So very highly lucrative. And we actually think that that's probably just the starting point, sort of the entry point of these crabs in the market. We think that likely we will be able to um, uh, see a, a potentially a higher price per pound as we continue to develop these markets. So um, the rest of the presentation is really just um, devoted to talking about 
the development of the fishery and sort of the steps that you would take if you want to participate in this fishery. Again, this is sort of um, how we've pivoted. Instead of doing a hands-on training workshop, we wanted to provide that sort of content um, in a virtual format. So this first step to this fishery is, of course, harvesting. Um, and so there's some pictures here um, of, of some of our fishermen partners who have been working with us on this project. Um, harvesting green crabs is a lot like harvesting any other crab species or, or like lobsters. So um, the most common method is just using traps. Um, lots of different types of traps can catch green crabs. Um, these traps here that are pictured are actually a retrofitted eel trap, but we've used all sorts of different um, styles and sizes of traps to catch them. Um, green crabs really like shallow near shore habitat and so you can either fish from a boat or you can fish from the shoreline. So that's the picture on the right here. Um, our partner Chris Jameson actually um, setting a trap right from the shoreline. Or um, unlike a lot of other crustacean species, you can actually just walk the shoreline and slip over rocks and seaweed and collect them by hand. You don't even need traps or access to a boat. So um, that's one of the really appealing things about this fishery is that it has a very low cost of entry in terms of the, the gear and supplies you would need. Now, one thing that Gabby and I have really focused on is figuring out what the season for soft shells is. So you have to figure out when the crabs are molting. Molting is the process crustaceans go through to shed their shell and grow bigger. They shed that hard exterior shell and their new shell underneath is very, very soft. And that is when that's that lucrative soft shell product that you would like to harvest. So our work has shown that for Maine and New Hampshire, there's a seasonality for molting for male crabs from May through July. Um, or if you think about this on a more geographic scale, um, that the season might not be exactly the same for Southern New England or for Canada. So we've really linked it to temperature. So what we're finding is that when the water temperature starts to reach about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, we start to see these male crabs molting. Now I'm gonna stop for just a second and, and let Gaddy um, speak, speak up here because um, as I said, we're really for the presentation focused on male crabs. But Gabby actually has spent a lot of time looking at female crabs and, and you know, studying that potential for, for fishery and the seasonality with the females. So I'm gonna let Gabby just um, talk about that for just a second. Sure, thanks Marissa. Um, so what's really exciting about, um, about this fishery is that we could potentially have two uh, soft shell crab seasons, one in the spring for males, like Marissa said, when. Um, the peak for, for male molting is May through July, around 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But females, turns out, molt a little bit later in the summer and early fall. So around mid-August to around mid-September is prime uh, season for, for female crabs to molt. Um, and so the idea that you could potentially have two seasons for soft shell product is really exciting. And it's very different from uh, some of the other soft shell fisheries like the blue crab fishery where it's only for a, a short amount of time and you know once it's done it's done so this could mean um, you know an expansion of, of the product for you know early in the season and then later in the season um, and females definitely like it a little bit warmer we've shown that um, probably around not that much warmer about 62 to 63 degrees Fahrenheit um, but like Marissa said, temperature really does play a big role um, in, in, the, in the seasonality of these crabs. So, thanks. Okay, great. So um, yeah, so that's sort of the, the harvesting part of it. Um, once you've harvested the crabs, the next step is to sort and identify the pre-molt crabs. So pre-molt crabs are any crabs that are within about a two to three week period away from molting or becoming soft essentially. So we refer to them as pre-molt. Um, so you catch your crabs and you have to sort through and remove these pre-molts because those are the ones that you want to save because they will become the soft shell lucrative product. Um, so again, some, some pictures of some of our project partners working here. This is um, Jamie Bassett, who's a fisherman in Chatham, Massachusetts. Uh, who's been producing soft shell crabs. This is Jonathan Taggart. He's the, the um, 
person who connected us with the Venetian fishery. And then Chris Jamison here on the right, who's a lobsterman in Maine and has been producing a lot of softshell crabs as well. Um, so essentially what we're finding is that within that season, May through July, on average about 15% of the crabs that you harvest will be pre-molt. Now that does change depending on, you know, if you're in the peak of the molting, um, sometimes we've seen as much as 45% of the harvest is pre-molt, but on average it's really only about 15%. So that's sort of the first caveat or hurdle here is what do you do with the excess crabs that you're not using for the soft shell fishery, the crabs that aren't pre-molt. So we're going to talk about that at the end of the presentation, so just stay tuned um, on that front. But I do want to just point out here, um, one of the things that we have adapted from the Venetian fishery is this sorting table, um, which actually works really well. You know, it's at sort of, you can, you can easily stand next to it instead of bending over to sort through crabs. Um, and also if you're dumping all of your crabs onto this table, they're kind of, it's on a little bit of an angle and they're doing some of the work for you in that they're sort of, um, you know, crawling down the slope and then eventually falling into a crate that's below here. Um, so you're picking out your pre molts and everything that you want to discard is just sort of walking down this little chute and dropping into a crate. Um, so that works really well. Now um, the next part, the most important part, is, is this pre molt crab. So how do you identify them? What do these pre molt crabs look like? So this is a pre molt male green crab. Um, and so this is actually from a publication by some researchers at the University of Prince Edward Island, where they're also trying to develop a soft shell fishery. Um, and so essentially these arrows and circles are indicating the areas on the underside of the crab that you're looking at for these indicators that it's pre-molt. And so here, um, you know, we see sort of this coloration along the edges of all of these platelets, almost like a dark shadowy line. Um, and what's happening is that the new shell that's growing underneath the old shell is starting, the, the two shells are starting to separate and it's creating sort of this shadow region. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the things that we're looking at. If you compare this crab to a crab that is not pre-molt, so just, you know, one that we're not really that interested in because it's not going to molt anytime soon, you can kind of see that there's just this uniform color on these platelets um, and you don't really see any of the sort of distinct lines that you see on this crab over here. Now I'm going to pause again because as I said this is a this picture is a male crab. What we're talking about today is really focused on the male crabs but I'm going to have Gabby just really uh, briefly talk about some of the signs that you're looking at on a female crab that's pre -mal. Yeah so we're going to keep it on this slide for the time being but um for females, one of the things that you need to um, note, if you don't know how to tell a male crab from a female crab, this area here um, in the middle, uh, labeled C, is uh, the what we call the apron on a male, and in the and it's sort of uh, spade shaped, or <laughs> we like to, or I say sometimes it looks like the um, Washington Monument, but on females. Uh, they have uh, their apron looks more like the Capitol building or a beehive. And so it takes, uh, it takes up a lot more space on the underside of the crab. And so where you will be looking, this, the, um, the signs are still very similar, but they're harder to find because most of the underside of the female is taken up by this apron. So where you wanna look mostly is if you look on, um, if you look at, the inset here uh, labeled A, you want to look at those um, episternites there um, for that halo effect that you are, are looking at for in the, in the males. The other, um, the other option, and it's difficult to tell on females, is they tend to become a little bit more uh, soft and brittle right before they shed. And so you could do sort of a finger squeeze test on some of the legs. And if they start to either break in your hand or they just feel a lot mushier rather than hard, you're starting to get into that pre-molt um, into that pre-molt phase. But usually if you look at um, at this at the top parts of those sternites on the underside of the females, you'll also find the halos. So thanks. Okay, and if you're thinking that you haven't quite grasped this yet, don't worry, because <laughs> we have several more slides dedicated to looking at these pre crabs. And also it is a process, a learning process in terms of 
you know, handling crabs and looking at photos and, um, you know, just sort of gaining the um, ability to recognize these signs. But it is it's definitely doable. Um, so that, that first sign, as Gabby called it, the halo, um, and what was sort of outlined before in that other um, diagram, is this, again, this line around the edges of, um, we call these episternites or platelets. Um, and, and so essentially there's this dark line, that shadow region, and then a lighter, almost white edge. And so we refer to that as the halo area. Um, and again, that's because the new and the old shell are starting to separate and create that region. So this is just some, you know, yellow lines sort of overlaid on the areas where we're looking. Also along the edge of the apron um, is another area where we start to see that halo appear. So um, again, just another picture of a pre-malt crab um, and, and sort of the, what we're looking at in terms of those dark shadowy areas and then the lighter uh, white halo area. So the next um, really important sign is the shell opacity. Um, and so this is a pre malt crab here on the left and you can kind of see these, you know, the halo area on the edge of these platelets and on the apron. Um, this crab on the right is very close to molting, likely less than 24 hours away from molting. And you can see that it's really become very opaque. It's lost a lot of color. It's sort of dull and grayish. It almost looks like the crab is dead. And that's because um, essentially at this point, the new shell is entirely separated from the old shell. And so all of this that you're seeing here is just shell that's going to be discarded essentially in the molting process. So we see this sort of absence of color, very dull, very opaque look to the crab. And then the third sign, which Gabby referred to as well, is shell brittleness. So you can essentially, when the crab is getting close to molting, use your finger to apply a little pressure and you can tell how brittle the shell is. It becomes very weak and thin and easy to crack. Um, this crab right here is actually, you can see there's this line between the carapace on the top and the body of the crab on the bottom where it's split. That's the first stage of molting where actually the carapace sort of lifts away from the body and that's how the crab will eventually emerge out of its old shell. So kind of putting this all together, um, these inter the, you know, the, the process of, of this growth cycle, this is an intermolt crab. This is a crab we're not interested in because it is not pre-molt. It's not going to molt anytime soon. It doesn't have any of those distinct markings on the underneath. Um, it also almost has a translucency to the shell um, rather than an opaqueness. The next stage is the pre-molt crab. These are the ones we are interested in when we're sorting through our catch. Um, so again, Doing a close up here, you can see that sort of shadow, halo line, the shell is more opaque. And then, oh, and then that's just sort of um, delineating that, that those areas we're looking at. And then what we would call an imminent molt crab or a crab that's within 24 hours of molting, which again has this very dull, grayish, sort of washed out look. The crab is also very lethargic, so that's another thing you can use behaviorally to, to tell if it's pre molt It's very lethargic, it's very weak at this point, it can't even pinch you, it doesn't have the strength to do that. Um, we also see that, you know, you can still sort of very lightly see that sign, that halo, but even that has really started to fade and wash out. So this crab is about 24 hours away from molt. So just a couple more pictures just to really hammer that point home <laughs> um, because again, recognizing the pre-molts is the most important part of the fishery. This is a pretty good example of one where it's really distinct, that really dark line on the outside of these platelets and the apron and then sort of the white halo. Um, this is a crab where uh, I took the picture in the shade rather than the sun. And so that's another thing you can kind of play around with the light and sometimes the, this um, sign becomes more apparent. Um, sometimes the shade is better than direct sunlight for seeing it. And then just again, compared to a crab that is sort of your regular average standard crab, not pre-molt, just in the intermolt phase, not a crab that you would be interested in keeping. 
And then one last one. Um, again, this is a pre molt crab. This is one that the, the photo is taken in the sunlight. So again, you can kind of play around with the, the lighting and how you're looking at the crab because sometimes the sign is more apparent in shade versus sunlight or vice versa. Um, so again, sort of you can see the, the shadow here on the edge of all of these platelets, the halo. And then here's our crab that's intermolt and not one that we would be interested in. So holding crabs like this side by side really helps when you're trying to learn these signs because things like this tend to jump out. Um, the, the halo tends to jump out when you have a pre-molt crab next to an intermolt crab. Okay, so once you have sorted your crabs, the next step is storing them. So you've harvested your crabs, you've pulled out all of the pre-molts, and now you need to store them. So um, at this point in time, uh, you know, until we potentially develop some other type of method, the, the, the way to do this is you really have to store these crabs individually housed. Because once a crab molts and becomes soft, the other crabs will cannibalize it. So um, we've developed this, what we think is a very cost-effective and efficient method for individually storing crabs. So this is a cage that is, um, it, it stores 28 crabs in, in this one cage. And it's made from all materials that you can find at any marine supply store. So this is um, a plastic mesh bag that's really commonly used in oyster aquaculture, stainless steel hog rings. Um, you know, this is a, a lobster or a shrimp trap mesh that's a little bit heavier gauged mesh. Everything that you see here for this cage, this one cage, total cost is probably somewhere around six to seven dollars. So not a huge investment and also very durable. We have cages that have been in use for two or three years and not sh showing any signs of deterioration. Um, these cages, you can stack three to four of them in a standard size lobster crate. So um, essentially you can have one lobster crate that has 84 to 112 crabs individually housed inside. Um, and again, this is all things, materials that are very easily available at any marine supply store. And oftentimes what we find is that the fishermen who are working with us for this project already have a lot of these materials on hand anyways, because they're things that they're using, you know, either in their lobster business or their clam business or their oyster aquaculture business. Um, so we have in our, in our sort of pilot phase determined that we can get $3 per crab when we are selling to restaurants or when fishermen are selling to restaurants. So, and I'll talk much more about that in just a minute, but um, that essentially translates to one of these lobster crates holding about $252 to $336 worth of soft shell crabs. So again, in terms of trying to find cost effective, efficient ways to store crabs individually, we think that this is a fairly good method. Um, Essentially, you would be checking these crabs daily. So, for instance, the lobstermen who work with us, they, you know, have their crates tied onto their mooring, and every day when they come in from lobstering, they just open the crates up to see if any of the crabs are holding. Not super time uh, consuming or time intensive. Um, and then um, we also recommend that you store the excess harvest of crabs. And so this is just a, a picture of our sort of field station we have in Georgetown, Maine where we're holding crabs, you know, we, we take our harvest, we put our pre-molt crabs into their individual cages and into crates, and then the excess crabs that we, you know, would need to be either discarding or getting rid of, we actually hold just sort of loosely in crates. And then we'll go back through those excess crabs once a week because you'll find that, you, you know, if you catch 100 pounds of crabs, you take 15 pounds of pre-molts out, and then you store the excess 85 pounds. You go through it a week later and you might find 15 more pounds of pre-molt crabs because they're sort of progressing through that molt cycle. So it's just a way of sort of recycling the crabs and, and reducing the amount of effort you're putting in in terms of trapping. So the molting process, um, you know, it's, it's fairly obvious when you see a crab that's starting to molt, it has this sort of split along the edge where you can see the carapace lifting off that progresses and this is a really great image of how this old shell is dull and opaque and faded and this new shell underneath is very bright and vibrant. 
Um, this is uh, a crab essentially that at the top here, a crab that's molted and it's old molt shell. And the same thing on the far right, this is the crab that's molted and it's old molt shell. So you can see the crab has increased in size. Again, molting is how they grow. So we see that they increase, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 percent of their body size through that molting process. Um, and what we've found out through um, the various different experiments that we've done is that we're at about an 82 percent success rate. So we identify a crab as pre-molt, we put it into a cage, 82% of the time, it actually molts and becomes a soft shell crab that can be sold directly to markets. So we're pretty happy with that success rate. Um, the next step, step four, is what happens after they molt. So essentially the crabs need to be removed from the cages within 20, or from the water essentially, within 24 hours of molting. If they're left in the water, they're actually going to harden back up pretty quickly. And so you want to get the crab out of the water um, when it's still soft, when it's the most valuable. And as soon as it's out of the water, that hardening of the shell process stops. And then the crab can actually be stored alive, refrigerated for up to two weeks. So they're very, even though they're in that very soft, weak stage, they're still um, incredibly durable and they can actually be refrigerated and kept, um, you know, just as long as they're kept moist or you know you use a towel or seaweed something like that they'll stay alive um, and so oftentimes what we'll see is that a fisherman will get you know check their crabs and get 10 crabs one day and five the next and 20 the next and they'll go through the whole week removing the crabs and just storing them in the refrigerator until they get to the end of the week and they have 50 or 100 crabs or whatever they have and they'll bring those to market and so the crab going to market is a live product. So the step five and last final step is the marketing piece. Um, so this is actually two deep fried soft shell green crabs um, being served at a restaurant in Brunswick called Enoteca Athena. So for the pilot production in 2018 and 2019, our fishermen partners produced about 100 crabs per week from June through July. And they, and this again, this was on a very small scale, just something that they were doing in their spare time because they all have full-time jobs. Um, and they sold them directly to local restaurants for $3 a piece. So again, something that was done sort of as a, a side project in their spare time was actually, you know, able to bring in about $300 a week extra on top of their normal fishing activities. Um, and, and that $3 each price translates to about $25 to $30 a pound. The restaurants love this product. Um, by all indication, market is not, the market demand is high. That's not um, a hurdle at all. Um, all the restaurants that we've worked with love the product. They put these crabs on their menu for $9 a piece and they sell out immediately almost every time. Um, and, and they very much like, um, excuse me, they very much um, appreciate a live product coming in um, as opposed to alternatives that might be something that's frozen. The, again, caveat here is that only about 15% of the catch is pre-molt. Um, and so once again, what do you do with all of these excess crabs that you're not using for soft shell production? Um, so, Essentially, um, you know, we'll run through a couple of different options. There's still a lot of sort of things in development in terms of what you do with these extra crabs. Um, like I mentioned before, keeping crates of those extra crabs is really well worth it because um, you can continue checking for the pre-molts in, in those excess crabs from one week to the next, and that limits the amount of effort you have to put into trapping. Um, uh, potential ways of discarding. Um, so if you need to discard the crabs because it is frowned upon to put them back into the water since they are an invasive species, um, easy ways to discard of them are to freeze or soak them in fresh water. That, you know, pretty quickly kills the crabs. Um, and then, you know, you can use them as compost. That's one way that we've seen people being very creative with these excess crabs. So our partner Jonathan Taggart actually took um, I think well over 100 pounds of crabs, soaked them in fresh water, and then um, the next day put them in his garden. And so he actually dug two trenches, 
filled one trench with crabs and the other just soil and planted two rows of corn. And this was the corn when he went back to harvest in the late summer. And so the corn on the right has green crabs in the soil and the corn on the left does not. So, uh, you know, certainly not a scientific study, but very interesting to see how much better the corn that had the crabs in the soil did compared to the other, uh, other corn. So that's one potential sort of home use for these excess crabs. The existing markets for green crabs really consist of the bait market. And so green crabs are used for bait in the whelk fishery in southern New England and the mid-Atlantic. Um, there is some development of potential baits that can be used for the lobster fishery utilizing green crabs. Um, and so these markets are, you know, large volume markets that deal with hundreds of thousands of pounds of green crabs a year. One of the challenges, though, is actually connecting with the markets. Most of them operate out of southern New England. And so, um, you know, that, that's an area where we hope to be able to develop some more connections. Um, other developing markets are really focused on value-added products. So anything from green crab stock or broth to um, a project Gabby and I are working on with the University of Maine, which is to use fermented green crab products like fish sauce, but made with crabs instead of fish. Um, and then there are some folks working on developing an actual commercial compost or fertilizer product for green crabs. Again, all of these are sort of in the developing phase, but we're really hopeful in the next few years that these are viable markets that can take volume amounts of green crabs. Um, and then I'm gonna hand it over to Gabby here to talk about um, some other potential fun uses of crabs, and then um, we're gonna wrap up and, and take some questions. Thanks. Um, Marissa, I just wanted to add a little bit more about the bait market for a second. Yeah. Uh, some of our fishers in New Hampshire in particular and in also in Southern Maine have been able to hit the recreational fishery um, uh, for Tatog and, and striped bass, I believe, um, especially down in Southern New England and in the Mid-Atlantic. So they've been able to tap into um, a much bigger sort of bulk bait market through that recreational fishery. Um, that is definitely something that is um, worth pursuing, um, especially up here as, you know, we see different species coming up that might be, um, that might be uh, fun to fish for uh, here in, in New Hampshire and Maine. So that, that's another, another option. Um, but that market uh, is, again, kind of hard to get into. And so there's a lot of sort of proprietary secret type things going on there. But, um, you know, you're willing to put the, the effort in, you could definitely tap into that market. Um, but then, so to switch uh, tax here for a second. Um, we have uh, a uh, one of our partners, uh, Tan Tai, um, is actually was um, one of our workshop participants several years ago. Uh, she's from New Hampshire, and she is a food blogger on on you know as well as a nurse, <laughs> and she has made um, this really wonderful resource. It's called GreenCrabCafe.com. Um, and it is a, a, a blog entirely for green crabs and how you can fish for green crabs. She shows you how to make your own um, recreational trap to go get some. Um, she also is really, really innovative in her use of, of green crabs as a culinary product. So she has um, recipes from um, anywhere from just a regular simple green crab stock so you can make soups and pastas and risottos and things like that all the way to um, salted green crab roe ice cream which by the way is quite delicious um, to uh, fried rice and ceviche so this stuff um, one of our uh, pilot projects has been to hit a lot of the quote-unquote foodie markets um, especially in the restaurant business here in in New Hampshire and in Maine, and it's a lot more gourmet. What Tan does is make it much more accessible for any home cook um, to, you know, hey, we, we want to try some of these green crabs, uh, let's go get some, and she can guide you through that process. Um, so I really recommend that you check it out. And she has really beautiful photos and um, very good descriptions of, of what to do. And it's really not, not as intimidating as you might think. Um, there's a really good ramen recipe for that as well. And some of our other um, partners, uh, chef partners have also helped us in that. 
um, you know, developing some of these recipes. And um, if you go to our websites, we, uh, we have those recipes or you can email us and we can, we can hand those out as well for you. So don't want to prolong this. Um, so I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah, we are happy to take questions. This slide is just meant to sort of highlight our fishermen partners and restaurant partners. Um, I've been asked in the past for a list of restaurants that potentially serve green crab. So um, this was also a way of getting some of that information out. And then uh, contact info for both Gabby and I uh, in the event that folks want to reach out to us directly um, after the webinar. So yeah, happy to answer some questions. Uh, well, we've got uh, several questions that have come in. The first is, how conceivable would export be uh, to Italy? Um, I think that, I mean, I certainly think it's conceivable. I think one of the things that um, when we first started connecting with the Venetian fishery and fishermen, that was actually one of their big concerns was that if we developed a fishery that we would be in direct competition with them. Um, I don't think that we are anywhere near, I mean, I know we're not anywhere near filling the domestic demand for this product. Um, we have a long, long, long ways to go just to fill the domestic demand. Um, and so I think, you know, we would be talking or more probably into the future where we would actually be looking at needing to export this product. Um, not necessarily other green crab products, but just the soft shell product. I think there's more than enough demand in this country to, to really um, take up what supply exists now and any future supply that is growing. Um, but the hard shell product, I think, is definitely something to consider. Um, I do think that potentially Asian markets might be um, the first step in terms of exporting potential hard shell product. The, uh, the next question we have comes from Delaney who asks, are there any major differences between hard shell and soft shell crabs other than the difference in their shell? Um, and Gabby, feel free to jump in. I would say just in terms of the color, it's really just the culinary use and, and what you can do with them. So the soft shell crabs can, you know, be deep fried whole shell and all, the hard shell crabs becomes very difficult because it's hard to extract the meat because they're so small. And so you have to think of other potential ways to utilize the product. Um, but that yeah. is no, I would, I would agree with you, Marissa. And also one of the reasons we've been focusing on trying to do the soft shell product is that you um, get, you know, uh, more bang for your buck, actually. You get to have a, a much, you get more of the crab that you can use. Um, the, I guess my only, the only other difference, um, especially for hard shell female crabs, is that if you're in the right season, there's also um, the internal row, which is also a pretty, um, pretty delicious and a good sort of value added product to, to harvest and sell as well. Um, I know a lot, I know there's a lot of interest in, in getting that market going as well. So that's one use for the hard shell females. Um, and so on that and stocks, they're really good for broths and things like that. Steve asks, what is the size range of crab desired by market? What's too small versus too big? That's a um, very interesting question because um, what we have found here in the U.S. is that, or at least some of the chefs that we've worked with really like a bigger crab um, and I think that is maybe because they're familiar with soft shell blue crab and so soft shell blue crab usually is you know fairly big like you know plate size or burger size type crab um, and so that's what the product is that they're used to and so for the green crabs they have been you know leaning towards the larger crabs in Italy it's the exact opposite and they actually really prefer the smaller crabs so if you remember that photo I showed of the deep fried crabs with french fries, it's much more similar to like getting a clam basket or a scallop basket um, in terms of the size and quantity of crabs that you would get on your plate. Um, and so I think there's definitely room for developing, you know, markets for all sizes of the crabs. It's just a matter of sort of what chefs are used to, at least at first, and what they, you know, what their preference is, and also what consumers are willing to, to eat. So 
I think oftentimes consumers are also more familiar with soft shell blue crab, which is a bigger crab. And so the smaller crab is a little bit of a harder sell, but they're just as delicious. So. <laughs> So I want to jump in on that, Marissa. I know that when we were doing the pilot work um, with our chefs, at least in New Hampshire, I asked them that question and they said, well, we'll take anything, um, you know, but on average, they want um, the size crabs to be anywhere between two and a half to three inches across. That's the average. Um, it's, and, and also for the fishermen and us anyway, they don't get much bigger than what, what would you say, four inches across? Very rarely do you get like a five incher. Um, and that's really just way, way up in Eastport, Maine that I've ever come across them. But, um, but around two and a half to three inches. And that's what we have always, um, in terms of our research and, and what we were targeting for are those size crabs. Um, the idea is that um, it gives you a little bit more flexibility if you wanted to do, you know, like, um, for an appetizer or for, you know, kind of like a slider type of, um, of meal. Um, I also, we have also done in, um, at least in New Hampshire, an, an informal um, uh, pilot study on the smaller soft shell crabs, which are actually, and hard shell crabs, which you can actually deep fry and kind of make it into a popcorn um, snack kind of thing. And there was definitely a size preference for them. You want them, those you want as small as you possibly can because you do eat the whole thing all at once. And some of our participants were a little, if they were about an inch um, in that popcorn size range, people started to get a little weirded out with all the legs. <laughs> so if they're smaller um, and in that, in that sort of um, presentation, that goes over really well. And, um, and then the bigger one also for the chefs is sort of where we've been looking at. We've had a couple of questions related to permits. So uh, someone asked, do you need special permits to harvest uh, and sell green crabs? And Jessica, uh, actually, um, Kate asked, do you need a license to sell green crabs to restaurants? So um, Gabby and I can both tackle this one because it goes state by state. So you have to check with your state department that regulates marine species. So for us in Maine, it's the Maine Department of Marine Resources. Um, if you want to harvest green crabs for your own personal consumption, you do not need a permit of any sort. You can go harvest as many as you want. Um, the only thing you have to conform to are trap regulations. If you are using traps, they have to conform to what's allowable, and all of that information is available online through the, the department's website. Um, if you're just harvesting them on the shoreline, no permit needed, and that's for your own personal consumption. If you're harvesting them to sell commercially, you need a commercial green crab license, and that is something that you can fill an application out for on the Maine Department of Marine Resources website, and it only costs $10. That's very similar in New Hampshire, Marissa. Um, the, only, the only difference in New Hampshire is that there's no limit. to the, If you are going to harvest green crabs and sell them to restaurants or for any other commercial purpose, um, you do need a commercial, um, a commercial fishing license, but there is no limit on how many of the crabs you can, you can harvest. Um, and uh, the only thing that you have to be aware of is that you can't keep any of the other bycatch like Jonah crabs or lobsters or things like that. So as far as fish and game is concerned, fish out all the green crabs, you're, you're good to go. Um, where it's not quite as um, defined as in Maine is, um, is who can sell the green crabs to whom. As far as we um, understand and we haven't had any problems is um, yeah you can sell to restaurants and we've been able to sell them at farmers markets very similar to if you were you know sort of selling off the boat lobsters and things like that um, but although you know because it is so new um, it would definitely require a call to Fish and Game to clarify and that's who our agency is New Hampshire Fish and Game. Uh, Jessica writes, I've heard from fishermen who would like to get into the fishery but are unsure how to find a buyer or a market. How can fishermen best connect with buyers and distributors? 
So um, we're always happy to field questions like that if people want to reach out to us directly and connect fishermen with restaurants that we've worked with. Um, I would say the what has been my experience is the fishermen that I've worked with have often used existing connections. Um, so, you know, if they sell lobsters direct to restaurants or, um, you know, other potential seafood items. Um, but then a lot of it also has just been fishermen walking through the door of a restaurant and introducing themselves and bringing some of that soft shell product with them and leaving it with the chef to try. And that has worked really well. Um, and so, you know, I think that that's definitely something that chefs are very open to, it seems like, and, you know, fishermen are willing to take that extra step that can really create some, some great partnerships. Um, and then there's another thing I was going to say, and I forget now. I don't, Gabby, if you have anything to add on that. Um, well, I think right now we're at such an early phase of it um, that it is a lot, uh, we've had a lot more success with direct direct sales um, to restaurants and chefs and so on. Um, I do think that there, um, it's worth talking to the bigger um, uh, dealers or distributors. Like um, in Boston, there's Red's Best. And I know that they have reached out um, in the past to try and get green crabs um, for restaurants at a, at a higher um, uh, volume. So that is somebody to connect to. Uh, and then the same thing with um, sort of the larger bait markets. Right now, we're still, that's where you and I have come in, is we're trying to spread the word, make the connections with the fishers and with the restaurants and with potential buyers. Um, right now, while there's an explosion of green crabs, um, the, the soft shell process and the product is not yielding as much as you know i think dealers and distributors would really want high volume and we're just not quite there yet so direct sales is really good to go <laughs> uh, laura asks uh any issues with molting crabs dying in the cages and is there anything that should be done to maximize survival yeah um we have seen that um not at well it, it depends i guess so we've seen that some crabs just fail at molting and that's just a product of you know nature um not necessarily uh, related to the cage just some crabs don't make it through the molt cycle the molt process um so we have seen some mortality that we think is just likely more sort of a reflection of that um, we did at first see that the original sort of design we were using of the cages, the cells were a little bit small. And so we think that that actually probably had a negative impact too, because the crab didn't have enough space in order to molt successfully. And so the, the sort of the bigger those cage individual cells are, I think the better, although then you have to sort of weigh the cost of space. Um, and then um, there's also sort of environmental factors to, to think about as well. And so, and I know Gabby has also experienced this, um, you know, things like if you have a huge rainstorm that dumps four inches of rain, um, and your crabs are all floating on the surface of the water and all of a sudden experience a huge drop in salinity, that can cause a mass mortality event. Um, and that's, you know, the case with lobsters often as well. Um, so there are things like that that, that you have to consider. Um, and then, you know, also movement. I know that um, some places that fishermen have chosen to store crabs have been more high traffic areas in terms of boat traffic. And so there's a lot of waves and wake and that's causing the crates and the cages to move a lot. And I think that has also led to sort of higher mortality. Um, so those are definitely all really important things to consider when you're thinking about where you would store crabs and, um, you know, sort of the conditions in which they would be experiencing. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I, I would agree. The only thing I would, um, in my experiments before, um, so I have similar, I call them crab condos. <laughs> um, but yes, we have each of those, um, of the, of the individual housing or the squares, the um, units, 
they're four by fours in my, in my crates. Um, but the gauge of the wire that I use was a little too big. And so my biggest mortality last year was um, before we fixed it or reinforced it with smaller um, mesh was that, you know, if you have them close together, they will eat each other. Um, and so I would, you know, I would be, so I would have all these pre-molts and I would open up and I would see that it had molted, but then the crab was half eaten already because they would go in through the mesh and so on. So that's, I think that for me was the biggest, um, was the biggest source of mortality if it wasn't, you know, a lack of oxygen for whatever reason. Um, that's the, the only other one that really caused a lot of high mortality was if there was not enough oxygen circulating through the system. So um, mesh size is important. So George uh, notes that water temps in the shallow portion of Great Salt Pond on Block Island are now in the 70s. And he asked, when will the water be too warm for molting? Well, hi, George, um, first and foremost. <laughs> uh, George has been, and some folks on Block Island have actually been piloting some of their own work in um, uh, developing a soft shell and other green crab fisheries down in Rhode Island. So that's really great to hear from him. Um, uh, you know, that's a great question. There's definitely an upper threshold to temperature tolerance with the crabs. And I would say just in, you know, given the nature of where Gabby and I have done the, the majority of our work, which is the northern Gulf of Maine, um, we haven't come into contact all that much with those sort of upper temperature threshold limits. Um, but, you know, I would say that that's something that monitoring can hopefully um, uncover in terms of just, you know, when and where are you seeing pre-molt crabs? Um, likely, uh, you know, like we see up here, the males will start molting first and then the females. So that's, you know, hopefully something that could be detected through monitoring or even um, Gabby and I were just talking before this about, um, you know, walking along the beach and seeing the empty molt shells. And so that's another indication that crabs are molting if you're finding those empty molt shells washing up on the shoreline. So you might be able to tell from that just some seasonality of when the molting is occurring. I would assume that there's going to be an upper temperature threshold where molting just stops because it becomes too physiologically stressful. Mm -hmm. But again, I just, I don't know that necessarily from the work that we've done up here because our water is very cold. But good question. Well, in New Gabby, Hampshire, feel free to. In New Hampshire, you start reaching, um, so right around early, like right around now is when we start seeing the tapering off of um, molting males, right? So from May to about mid-June to early July, um, I don't think I've ever got, I won't say that. Very rarely do I see males molting past the 4th of July. Um, and we do get uh, temperatures that are up, you know, getting near 70. So I think they're, um, from a past experience, the, the limit is around 67, 68. And then it really slows down. Of course, you're going to have those stragglers that do it earlier and colder and some that do it, you know, molt at like 70. Females, though, like it a little bit warmer. So, you know, when, once you start hitting August um, temperatures, you'll probably start seeing um, females molting a lot more um, readily in like early to mid-August, probably in Rhode Island. You might even start seeing them at the end of July, um, but they go through mid-September. So they like that little bit warmer, warmer temperature, um, but the males don't. They really, I haven't, I very rarely see molting males of the size that we're looking for past the 4th of July. If we have time for a couple more questions, uh, this one comes from Melissa. She asks, do you think that warming waters will bring blue crabs north to New England and do blue crabs and green crabs coexist? Um, yeah, that's definitely a great observation. Blue crabs are actually already in parts of New England, definitely parts of southern Massachusetts. There's actually a population of them in um, Nova Scotia, which is bizarre, but, um, you know, somehow they bypassed the rest of the coast and made it up to Nova Scotia. Um, and there's been random sightings of them throughout northern Massachusetts, the coast of Maine, um, you know, just one or two here and there. 
that you hear of, but they're coming and, you know, as the water temperature continues to warm, they're just going to continue progressing further and further north. Um, they do outcompete green crabs, so there are places where they already coexist, and that is potentially one, um, you know, reason why in some areas where you see blue crabs and green crabs, green crabs are maybe not quite as abundant because the blue crabs are sort of a, a bigger, stronger, better competitor and potential predator also of, of green crabs. So yeah, that's going to be a really interesting dynamic to see play out as we see the species continuing to change. Um, you know, blue crabs aren't the only species that will be heading north. There's other potential predators of green crabs. Um, and so, you know, that that's going to be a very complex um, you know, ecosystem sort of functioning dynamic to, to watch. Yeah, I agree. Do you have them in New Hampshire, Gabby? Blue crabs, uh, very sparsely in, yeah. uh, in Great Bay, but um, just two seconds on that. If you notice sort of the range of where the green crabs are, they overlap in the mid-Atlantic with like um, in Virginia and uh, Maryland and southern New Jersey. And I've been to all those places and I have looked for green crabs and I mostly only find blue crabs. So they definitely outcompete the green crabs. So in a way that might be some good biocontrol, but that would also be an invasive up here. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, we, we are definitely getting them. And uh, our last question comes from Eric and he asks, what are the next steps for getting businesses or side businesses profitable and off the ground? Well, we certainly hoped that, um, you know, one step in that direction would be these you know, in-person hands-on trainings and workshops, which we will definitely continue to work on. Um, you know, we've pivoted for now to this virtual content, but a lot of it is just working with fishermen, training fishermen so that they can get up and running and producing soft shells. Um, I said I think that the market piece kind of takes care of itself to some extent I mean we certainly will continue to work on that front but it, from my experience there's more demand than there is supply at this point and so it's really a matter of increasing supply so that there's you know a steady available supply within the molting season and I think that you know we'll see that the market demand just sort of follows um, and so that's really what Gabby and I are focusing on at this point is training fishermen, getting more people involved in the fishery, producing more soft shells. Yeah, I think that's the trick is just to getting more, you know, is getting um, more interested parties willing to do this um, once, and it's just practice. And once you get the hang of it, it actually um, can become, you know, pretty easy and you can also think of it as, you know, it's two very short seasons, right? At most, maybe six weeks. So um, on either end for males and females. So while it's intense, I think it's worth the effort in terms of, of the labor that it, and monitoring that it would require. But I think training the, training the uh, fishermen or fisher, fishers is, um, is it really the next step. All right. Well, thank you both so much for sharing your insight with us. Uh, this has been great. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon for this presentation. I know many of you joined us are longtime members and supporters of Manament. So I just want to say thank you and let you know how grateful we are for your commitment, your generosity. And uh, if you want to learn more about Manament, we're at manament.org. You can find our full event calendar and see all the upcoming virtual programming that we have. Uh, We've got a lot of stuff uh, that we're planning for the summer, so be sure to check that out. That's manament.org. And again, Gabby and Marissa, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks.